तत्सवतुर्वरेण्यम भर्गो देवस्य धीमहि ध्यो यो न प्रचोदया वेलकम टू द फिफ्थ एपिसोड ऑफ रीड अलॉन्ग विथ प्रैंक्स वॉट बेटर डे देन सरस्वती पूजा टू हैव विथ अस द ऑथर ऑफ सरस्वतीज गिफ्ट कविता केन इट इज अ स्टार स्ट्रक मोमेंट फॉर मी बिकॉज आई कंसिडर हर माय मेंटर व्हेन इट कम्स टू राइटिंग she is an revolution in indian literature when she writes about mythological fiction she has brought many lesser known mythological women character into the center stage all her seven books are master strokes and i'm proud to say i have read them all and would love to read them again today we are honored to have you ma'am with us as we speak about saraswati's gift which is just not knowledge but way beyond which you have spoken in the book i want to know the journey of yours when you made saraswati a human character and walk along with us thank you for coming to our show and talking to us about this beautiful book saraswati's gift thank you priyanka and uh... thank you uh, i think first and foremost i think i should wish all of you all a happy saraswati puja because i think uh, uh, I, i remember this book uh, last year we sort of announced the that uh, this book is going to come out so that was a saraswati puja thing and uh, i think yes today is the perfect day to dis- talk about my book and uh, talk about saraswati talk about saraswati puja and uh, i think that's what i think uh, honestly what i was trying to say uh, is about saraswati who is beyond the saraswati puja so when you said humanize saraswati i said yes i think she, i seriously believe she walks amongst us she is with us she is with us always she is a guiding force she is a teacher but it's just that we seem to have sort of uh, forgotten her we have neglected her and i think we are living in a world where there is uh, knowledge but no wisdom so i think that was the main reason why i wrote this book i think it was a, so, it's it was my ode to it was my tribute to my dedication to the goddess and today let's remember saraswati's gift on the birthday of this book <laughs> yes <laughs> so at then, least at least the conce- at least the conception time <laughs> yes so writing mythological fiction in a country mm-hmm. like india with firm religious believers Mm-hmm. can be risky but you have aged on this genre mm-hmm. my question here are three how does one put up their point without diluting the mythological essence or the story and still walking on that thin line have you ever gotten into the co- any controversy on any of your book and how much research goes into writing a book mythological oh, fiction it's a very long complicated question but i think i'll just break it first yeah. and foremost um, i think we talked about i think i believe uh, we underestimate our readers because i think the readers definitely know the difference between facts fiction and uh, sensationalism so i think when i'm writing this genre uh, it's not being i'm being extra careful or anything but i think the readers do understand what i'm trying to say uh, i stick as much as i can to the fact of course there is fiction because i'm dramatizing certain events and episodes certain people certain characters so there is a very um, large extent of dramatization so the fiction part definitely comes in but i think uh, people do accept the character whether it's urmila whether it's meenka whether it's satyavati or ail or even surpana ka negative character like surpana ka or even a fictitious character like kurvi in the first book she was actually a fictitious character uh, which i had to sort of create for certain reasons but anyways what i'm trying to say people did accept it because i think in the end they want to hear the story and the essence of the story i think that is very important because what i want what the author wants to say as long as it is conveyed 
to the readers and they understand it and they comprehend it and they appreciate it and they enjoy it. I think that is uh, that is what the whole uh, journey is about. You know, the whole book is about. It. So when it was Saraswati, it is the first time. Yes, the first time I'd written about a goddess. So of course, I was skeptical, but I wanted to show. Uh, uh, there is no question of. Uh, uh, a, I think Saraswati. I think is somehow somehow been sidelined. We don't know much about her. That is one thing. She is sort of a, a marginalized goddess, if you say. We know more about Saraswati. We know more about Parvati and Lakshmi and Durga. So that was one reason. And uh, another reason is, I think, uh, I mean, this actually, this book is the most controversial, if you actually say amongst all the six. Uh, no, I have not received any negative feedback. Uh, in the sense, no, I don't think there's no there's sort of a controversy or a negative feedback. No, because I think I was trying to show her beyond a goddess. Yes. She's much more than a goddess. I think I sort of, she's a personification of certain the, human sen, uh, sentiments, certain human ambitions, certain human desires. So I think that is why, that is why goddesses are born. That is how goddesses are born. Because I think especially with us, we are not only making goddess uh, of a with respect and worship the natural elements we also uh, respect the spiritual it's also it's a, saraswati is a completely on an abstract intellectual spiritual level so i think if we could make her a goddess of knowledge what does she embody so i think that was very important and uh, i think for the reader that understood it what I wanted to say, uh, what I desperately wanted to say, because as I said, if I ever wanted to write about a goddess, I had decided that I would write on Saraswati. So even about the other books, if you're talking about other characters, I think they have been uh, received pretty well. In fact, uh, I think Urmila and Urvi are extremely popular. Yes. Um, and uh, Even princes of... You know, even 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 uh, gray, uh, gray shades like uh, uh, Menka or Surpanaka or even Satyavati, you know, they were. And Ahila again again was a, actually was a very controversial figure, but I think her point of view was very important for people to know. I mean, as she like for her, if you call her a devoted wife and then you call her a promiscuous woman, her entire yeah. how does yeah. the transformation happen? Or did the transformation happen, or was it as perceived by society? So you know all these uh, layers behind. A certain episode or a certain event which we uh, which is cited in the epics so i think uh, no i think i have huge respect for the readers and uh, i think we really we really do uh, under undervalue them underestimate them i think we have we sort of insult the intelligent by saying that uh, you know they under that that is why and you're talking about mythofiction mythofiction has always been a part of uh, vernacular literature if you actually oh. see, I think, uh, so I think coming back to your question, I'd uh, say, no, I think uh, touch wood, touch wood. I think till now, there has been no controversy. And how much research goes into making one book of mythological? Fiction? Lots. I mean, the research is an ongoing thing. Lots. I mean, without research, you cannot, it's the foundation of your book. I mean, you cannot proceed, uh, you can really cannot, uh, I mean, the story idea comes from the research. Uh, many times because if, especially for the next book so while doing research i said okay this this i mean sort of list out uh, yeah. possible uh, <laughs> potential uh, protagonist but uh, the research is ongoing in fact i have to sort of stop myself and say okay now it's time to write enough yeah. of too much of reading mm -hmm. and eventually because you get so much of information and for me i have to do a lot of it uh, I, I have to do a lot of searching in the sense because there's seen most of them are minor characters most of them are marginalized characters there's not much information about them so the, a lot of time goes in the searching part of it more the, the search part of the research so once i get that information sometimes i get a lot of it uh, not about the character but about the bigger characters or the major characters so sort of filtering that that information and sort of uh, uh, trying to dot, uh, you know, join the dots and make it a rational narrative and make a story where, especially with Saraswati, because Saraswati's stories are very rare, very few, and uh, whatever they are very assorted. So there's no chronological yeah. time, of course. Yeah. So trying to collect them, collate them, and then uh, bring it, uh, you know, try to bring a certain uh, rationality, a certain believable. And of course, the whole time factor, which, uh, you know, like stories are jumping from 
the, the creation of the uh, the world right up to Ramayana and then again coming back. Saraswati is always going to be there. So it, this chronological part was the most difficult part about uh, writing this book was because there is no time factor because she's there. She's always there. So and she's she's, a... uh, so, so those, uh, bringing the, all those incidents and those episodes together, uh, so researching for them, uh, that yes, because uh, fortunately most of it, most of the information nowadays is digitalized, so it is sort of a living room uh, library which we have. But uh, yes, but it's it is it's continuous, it's ongoing, and I think it is the most important factor because uh, the most all these characters are borrowed. So I have to do a lot of research because they are not my characters which I can sort of have complete creative freedom over. So I think, yes, I have to, as I said earlier, I, I try to stick to the original. Try Jitna because uh, which is uh, the image which is in the popular uh, collective mind because uh, I would not like a completely bizarre interpretation of a character who is very popular. So that's it. And like you said, because Saraswati is always present it is taken for granted. That's why I think we don't talk about Saraswati so much. Mm -hmm. So my next question is, born in an Indian community with Indian culture as our roots, from a childhood, every girl is taught that however big you make it in your professional life, end of mm -hmm. the day, you are a mother, you are a sister, you are a daughter, and most especially a mother. So, uh, you know, and you have tried to break this stereotype from by making Saraswati the path breaker. So do you think our society is ready to accept that change? And especially women, because they consider themselves this epitome of mamta. You know, uh, women think that giving birth makes them complete. So do you yes. think uh, the Saraswati's point of view uh, in the book can be accepted easily by the society? No, it's going to be difficult because I, actually what I was trying to say was we have to accept you cannot have everything. It's not, it's not going to be, if there is one side, if a woman wants to be a mother, if she wants to be a wife, she wants to have a child. There are also women who do not want to bond marriage and motherhood. So I think this book was more about trying to show their point of view, you know, because they, that is what they want. That is their choice. That is what they want to do with their life. And I think they have that for their equal freedom. They should have that equal freedom to choose that particular decision. So <clears throat> it was not, not, as I said, I mean, I have sort of, uh, sort of personified it through Saraswati and Parvati and Lakshmi because they are three, these are the three uh, roots or the three uh, sentiments, they are the three emotions, they are the three um, factor the three levels of womenhood. So womenhood is all encompassing. So you have to see see a woman not just as a mother and as a wife. She is also a woman. She is an individual who has who does she wants to be some if she wants to be what she wants to be, I think she should have that choice. That is very important. Whatever it could it could be a mother, it could be a wife, it could be uh, a career woman, a, a both uh, having a, I mean, it is like, uh, because I think women are sort of culturally influenced and they've been told to them to multitask. I mean, it's like we say women multitask more than men because men have never been trained to do that. Yes. These girls have always been pro told to multitask. So I think we grow up in that environment. So it is like for us, it is in one breath, we can say, oh, I'm a sister, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter-in-law, I'm a uh, you know, sister-in-law, I'm, I'm a... Everything. And, 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 and I have a professional life. I have an, another life or whatever. So what I think this sort of thing comes very... Actually, it comes very easily for a woman because she has already mentally accepted at a very early age that these are the different roles demanded out of her. So I think, uh, yes, it is. Uh, but I wanted to show, actually, it was not a question of this versus that. It is not at all that. I mean, it, uh, it was just showing uh, another part of womanhood where she sort of discounts mother, marriage and motherhood, which is, I think, fair enough because I think... Uh, Every woman, I think that is what freedom, individual freedom means as a human being, where his life, his right to existence, his right to his choices, his right to freedom. I think this is what is freedom, where he has to be, she has to be free 
to choose whatever she wants i think that is what so it is uh, the acceptance comes is is again has very strong societal familial uh, cultural connotations here i'm talking about a person now we are we now in a within a family within a community within a society then yes i think that a whole pressure comes on her but then i think she sort of uh, she is prepared for it and she uh, she is battling it out so to extend my question what i like most about this book is that the women is not fighting to make a name in the man's world but she's standing up for her core nature you know through saraswati or lakshmi or parvati they are standing up for their core nature so what according to you is feminism and do we need to fight a battle of feminism to be heard see i think the feminism i think unfortunately the word, <clears throat> the definition has been sort of distorted for whatever reason but i think personally i believe feminism we live in a world of men and women we cannot discount the men it is yes. we have to live together i yes. mean the whole thing is when i'm talking about it is feminism is not reverse sexism it is not anti male not at all because here it is a question of male and female giving the equal if they are two species in the human race man and a woman if man has been given certain let's say cultural rights societal rights the same rights has to be given to a woman because she is the other part of the species and she is the other part of the community she is a part of the part of the of your family she is another half of your, the world so i think it's just about feminism it's more that because the rights which have not been given to her over the centuries over millennia i think that is what she is she not even she has to fight it if she has to if you say she has to fight it out because there is certain Mm-hmm. hostility there is a certain there is a lot of discrimination there is a lot of disadvantage she has been suffering so i think there is definitely going to be a conflict but i think men and women have to work at it it is not about feminism and not just about women it's about the men participating in if for a girl it when she is born it is right from the father to the brother to the husband to her partner to her male in law or whatever they are all part of it it is not about it's not about she and and of course and feminism is not about just about uh, i mean uh, even <clears throat> uh women can be anti feminist so it is i mean the most uh, i think many women encounter that so feminism is a thought it is a certain ideology where you be where you respect you give an equal chance and opportunity to a woman as much as which you would give to a man that is all i mean it, it's a very it's a very egalitarian theory almost uh, it's almost an idealist concept because of egalitarianism because egalitarian itself equality itself is a very idealistic concept so it is an unequal uh, world a woman has been living in and uh, it's about she giving right from her right of her right of existence you know we you know the women or female fetus is about kill because they are going to be they are going to grow there will be a girl, female who will be a girl who is going to be born and it starts from there her, her survival starts from there so when she as she grows her right to education her right to choice her right to uh, marriage her her, her, her you know she to her right to choose who the, her partner whether she wants to marry or not so it all i, I mean the choices the decision come in every just that it comes to comes for a man for a woman it is double uh, difficult more than difficult and i think it's extremely uh, tumultuous it's, it's sort of a turmoil because there has been a lot of uh, i think this whole stranglehold of patriarchy which has been there and it is always going to be there patriarchy is not going to go so easily <coughs> but if you are talking about feminism again patriarchy is a thought it, it is a certain system which has been there which has been ruling over the society and not only our society all over the world so i think it's a question is how change i think the whole concept is of change i think as long as we welcome the change and it should be done in a ideally in a <coughs> harmonious way <coughs> but yes there is going to be conflict because <coughs> as you said there are going to be the expectation the cultural expectation the expected <laughs> cultural expectations will have to be broken stereotypes will have to be broken so i think these are very conventional images which uh, would you like water what it will definitely it is yeah 
um, so I think she's definitely going to extend her boundaries. Uh, as uh, uh, just she's as curious and adventurous as the man is. So it's, uh, when we're talking about uh, equality, we are not talking about sameness. A woman doesn't want to be like a man. Yes. They are two different genders. So I mean, yes. they are definitely going to be biological and natural differences. Uh, like the right to, the, you know, the she only a woman would. can give birth. Yes, which a man does. And the fact that a woman is physically weak than a man. I mean, that, that is why, that I think honestly, that is how he has ruled over the women all these years. Because of the physical strength. So I think these differences are going to be there. So this whole thing of woman wants to be like a man. No, I don't think a woman likes to be man. She just wants the chances and the opportunities given to him to be given to be given to her. I think that's all. What actually what feminism is about? Because that has not been given to her. She has been deprived of it for so many, so many, for ages down the ages. So I think it is just a. It's a, it's an awakening, and it it is definitely an awakening which I both have to accept it. Even the man has to accept it. So what importantly the man has said. So what I understood is feminism is walking together. It's yes. not about I'm taking it, your space. It's about mutual. Are... It, yes, it's about mutual respect. Yes. If a woman loves and respects a man, the man also has to love and respect her. I think I think respect comes higher than respect her as an individual. She is a human being. She is an individual. She is a person of her well, no own right. And I think that respect, that, uh, as you say, acknowledgement, that acceptance uh, has somehow not, she has been deprived of. So beautifully said. So let's make a space equal for both with respect. Uh, you, you know, a lot of books have been written on the central characters from mythology like Krishna, Shiva, even Vishnu, uh, and even some women characters like Draupadi and Parvati. And you have given space to lesser women, uh, known women characters from mythology. But do you think you would ever write or give space to lesser known men character from mythology like Ashwadhamma, Balram, Eklavya? Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. They are, I mean, minor characters themselves are a genre in itself, in the sense, the importance of minor characters. Of course, they are. But I'm more interested in the female characters simply because I, seriously, because their stories have to be told. <coughs> because that, uh, I think uh, a woman um, is, I think, I think men will also agree that they are more interesting, fascinating. <laughs> Uh, people uh, but more than that I think they are more layered because the stories uh, involve a lot of more drama uh, there is a lot of things which have been said as a, which are unsaid which have not been told so I think uh, the women have been not seen at all so I think I'll only, the only reason I think Aswatthama and as you say uh, Nakul and Sahadev and all these minor characters even Bharat for that matter in drama all the, so all these characters uh, are of course definitely interesting and uh, as it's fascinating. But the thing is, I write, I prefer writing about women only because of that. A, I am a woman because I can sort of relate more quickly to them, and uh, also because I think their stories need to be told. I honestly believe women should tell women's stories because uh, it's not about just supporting women, supporting women. It's up, because these stories need to be told because they are our stories. If you see, talk of, uh, they are, if, if I'm, if I'm telling the story of Urmila. I think people did identify with Urmila. I mean, there are modern Urmilas and Surpanakas and Minkas and Satyavatis and Ilyas in our society. It's still there. We see it around us. Yes. So there are our stories and they need to be told. I think that's that's the simple reason. I'm not denying they are you know, more interested. The men could be, so there are certain character, male characters which are more interested. But we have been seeing these stories always through the male point of view. So I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that in the sense I have already seen it, I've acknowledged it, and I find the women more. Uh, their stories uh, have been hidden, they have been sort of, the spotlight has to be on them. And I think uh, every book of yours, we find a part of us, like as a woman, I'm saying that every book of yours has a part of a woman, a woman can relate to. And even men, you know, sometimes can really understand a true nature of women through your books. So I think uh, what you said, rightly said is uh, women are more interesting because they have more uh, layers to open than men do. 
yeah actually when you're talking about male character i find uh, writing about the male character is uh, 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 more difficult in the sense uh, because they have been sidelined themselves like if you're talking about saraswati even brahma has been sidelined we actually yes. see we don't even know i mean brahma is sort of a old ancient man with his three heads i mean you don't see him beyond that yeah i mean brahma is one of the most uh, underhated and uh, unseen uh, undeciphered uh, sort of a god what he symbolizes i mean if he is a he is a creator the concept of creation why did he create you know this whole philosophy of creation then the relation between creation and creativity i think all this is what brahma and saraswati is about so i think uh, <clears throat> it was more difficult actually Uh, the 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 other half of Saraswati, you know, Brahma, I believe, and we never see them as a couple. You know, that is the you see a Lakshmi Narayan, you see a Shiv Parvati, but you never see a Brahma Saraswati. So that was, why? 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 And that was the most interesting part of the book when you talk about Brahma and Saraswati together, and Brahma so madly in love with Saraswati is a uh, enlightenment for uh, for a reader because we have never heard about their story. Yes, yeah, because uh, that's what I said. Because Brahma himself is sort of have been has been sidelined. There has because of Vaishnavism and Shaivism, which are the two main uh, streams of. So I think there is no Brahma has never been worshipped. So I mean that is the curse, of course. Now the whole story is that it is his wife's curse also. Yeah. So I think it's all very interesting the relationship. It's a uh, it's almost uh, a modern relationship they have. modern in the sense it is what a husband wife relationship usually is you know yeah. where there is love there is there is this whole struggle of love the concept of you know this and she is a woman of intelligence she is a she is a woman of her mind she she symbolizes the mind and he symbolizes the heart so the the clash of the heart and the mind and then this whole thing of love with love comes disappointment also so the disappointments how you tackle that in a relationship how you tackle that in a marriage so all this is i think that is what all relationships are about how what uh, saraswati and brahma are about and uh, this whole conflict and the togetherness if they are if it is if there is a marriage of the mind so if, if that is so it also comes with its uh, own share of conflicts and uh, attention so and what eventually happens and as i said uh, it is about creation and creativity the, the creator and the muse so i think this whole relationship i think both saraswati and brahma and I, again as i said at a very at a very abstract level what uh, intelligence the difference between intelligence education knowledge and wisdom all this is very fine so i think we we tend to take the sort of just take it all in one go that he is a very educated person but is he really educated you know he has yeah. got all the learning has he learned anything from it so there comes the wisdom so i think uh, through the different characters that was all Uh, it is uh, showing uh, the depth and the power of saraswati and tamma actually correct so another uh, question that i want to ask you which is you have given a little bit of answer on that is in the book you have made saraswati where saraswati rules the mind and brahma mm-hmm. rules the heart where mm-hmm. in the natural scenario in the society it's the opposite yes men men are considered where they they are ruled by mind and women are considered ruled by heart mm-hmm. but do you think if a woman is ruled by mind and men are ruled by mind the whole fa- family system will be okay to run or will there be a disruption in the whole society system no again i think again we are sort of making it very easy by saying heart and the mind but i think eventually sometime or the other i think it is the mind which is going to rule because that is the difference between uh, where uh, common sense rules over emotions eventually i mean if you are trying to say so as far as some it comes earlier some come it comes later so i don't think if two people uh, two individuals are uh, rule are uh, ruled by the mind there is going to be a clash of course there is going to be a clash but that clash has to be again harmonious you know in the sense there has to be a certain foundation of understanding you should know each other well i think in the end it all boils down to that it is when we are talking about heart and mind these are all different simple definitions we are sort of trying to uh, a lot different types of personalities but i think eventually any relationship 
these are certain terms understanding acceptance accepting even the flaws you know that is very important because we were we are only talking about the quality we also we have to talk about the flaws so it's a question of that's not the mind and the heart it's a question of how much are you going to take it and how much are you not going to take it how much are you going to allow yourself to submerge i mean saraswati is exact, actually that it is the realization of yourself so the self is very important so unless you know yourself well you respect yourself you are not going to have any harmonious relationship with anyone so you have to have a have a harmonious relationship with yourself so <clears throat> saraswati actually means that so i think that is the power of saraswati so with that comes the later yeah uh, no i mean what do you say later reality is as the first reality is about yourself so i think uh, coming back to what you said is, is there going to be a clash of course there will be a clash i mean this whole thing of you have to romanticize love and uh, relationships by saying that oh it's going to be happily ever after no it's not going to be happily ever there is a certain term there is going to be conflict there is going to be tension there is going to be disagreement but it has to be a harmonious there has to be the base has to be love and mutual love, mutual love and mutual respect so with that i think strong with that that foundation strong i think you can survive any really it's not only only about husband and wife or, or i mean to partners i'm talking about any really with your parents with your siblings with your colleagues it it all starts with that i mean you should know yourself without knowing yourself <clears throat> without a certain level of self realization also you have to be a certain self awareness <coughs> you're not going to succeed in any you're not going to succeed in life or in any relationships with yourself either <coughs> so that happened so now after a serious talk let's have this one fiery round where without any research and thought you just need to answer <laughs> Oh, spontaneous rapid fire yes it is a rapid fire yes. mm. so according to you who is a better husband vishnu or shiva i think shiva who is a better friend yamuna or ganga in my book i think i have uh, mm, it's more about uh, yamuna and ganga uh, yamuna and saraswati because uh, this whole rivalry of ganga and uh, uh <clears throat> i wanted to uh, sort of uh, remove that whole negativity but uh, i mean my uh, saraswati yeah. friend or my friend your uh, friend what ah uh, i think ganga because i think uh, personally uh, i would get along better with a ganga who do you think in today's generation men uh, a human being needs more a saraswati or a lakshmi i think both i mean honestly uh, but uh, <clears throat> to make lakshmi you need a saraswati na i mean to make, create wealth you need its amount of brains and of course luck also but i think this whole concept of luck i don't know you have to have so the lakshmi is luck and fortune it's also luck we always forget that so i think uh, it it is it is it is symbiotic it is it's, it's they are together in fact all the three are together <clears throat> okay. so that is why they are there you know so uh, i think yes i think i you need both you can't just say i need okay. lakshmi no saraswati okay. no saraswati but because you are going to seek uh but i think in today's world we need more saraswati right now i think we have okay. enough of lakshmi so we Everyone so we go we, we go <laughs> with saraswati yes i will i'll go with saraswati any time because i think uh, we have got a surplus of lakshmi now everyone seems to be <clears throat> of course that is uh, there is also uh, if there is a lot of lakshmi there is also a certain we have, we live in a country where there is this whole distinction of wealth and poverty is we see it in our daily lives so yes i think uh, <clears throat> that is why i think it's very ironical because uh, uh, i cannot say <sighs> i mean if you are thinking for everyone you need both ideally you need both because uh but uh, saraswati i'll say more because there is uh, the saraswati is not just knowledge as i said it is a certain awareness you have to know so i think it is a tool to make wealth so uh, saraswati is definitely a way of making wealth okay. giving so so who is a better combination uh, lakshmi and pa- and parvati 
Lakshmi and Saraswati or Parvati and Saraswati? Parvati as in the... Why double? Why not three? The, 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 ideally, they are three. They have to be together. You have to choose because one. Because it, it, it is about money. It's about and money. It's wealth, wealth, intelligence and power. So, right now, I think uh, intelligence and, I mean, money and wealth seems to be there everywhere. I mean, you see the world is exploding with that. And uh, that is why the exploitation and the discrimination also happens because of that. So I would still say Saraswati and um, Parvati. Because I and think Saraswati is power. I agree with I think you. Saras- <clears throat> uh, last one. The next book of Kavita Kin is a character from Mahabharata, character from Ramayana, character from mm. Devlok. Mm, I think Ramayana. Again, because I think I'm completely fascinated by Raman because I think we, we just don't take it. Um, they fi- everyone finds Mahabharat interesting, but I think Ramayana has not been, uh, we just see it as a, uh, you know, a very dramatic uh, family story with uh, uh, I, a lot of idealism thrown in. But I think that the layers, I think it's, it's uh, in short, it's a character on Ramayana. So, so it's a, for viewers to go pick up Ramayana and see which could be the next character that we are going to listen from Kavita King. <laughs> uh, yes. All her books, whether it is Sita's sister, Menika's choice, Ahilya, all of them are great reads. And all of you must pick up the copies and read. But first, do go pick up Saraswati's gift. For her true gift is just not knowledge. But a knowledge that how, what a woman stands for. Thank you, ma'am, for being with us. I feel sad to end this conversation, but looking forward for many more conversations with you on many more beautiful books coming uh, by you. And now I'm looking forward for which character would it be from Ramayana? Yeah, that, that, that is, of course, a guessing game. But uh, thank you, thank you again. Uh, Thank you, readers. And uh, happy Saraswati Puja to you. And uh, I think, of course, uh, the goddess's blessings. And I think uh, it's generally a question of uh, happy reading, happy learning. Namaste. I think it is like saying it is sort of uh, bowing to the goddess, bowing to knowledge, bowing to the entire, the complete uh, humility. that man, I think uh, we have been given a beautiful gift called knowledge and I think it is up to us how we use it. Let's utilize it. And then I think that is how we dedicate, how we we are the true worshippers of knowledge and learning. Thank you. And again, a happy to Saraswati Puja. With all the gratitude in our hearts, I request you all to please like, share, subscribe, and comment to read along with pranks. And don't forget to pick up the copy of Saraswati's gift. With all gratitude, thank you so much, ma'am, for being with us. And thank you, viewers, for watching us till the end.